Hello, this is Dr. Halisa Elwine. Welcome back to our continuing study in Creation Gospel Workbook 2. In last, uh, the last program that we went through, we were looking at the, the tree of life in the midst of the garden and how in the book of Revelation that John is seeing this picture in Revelation 22, 1 through 2. And this is part of our bigger discussion about the bosom or the chaik, where the, the souls under the altar in the fifth seal have been collected and now they're speaking out with one voice saying, How long, O Lord? And we saw this with Ezekiel's temple, how the boundaries at the bottom of that altar are called the chaik or the bosom. And so now it makes sense why we would have a, a phrase like Abraham's bosom. We understand now why Moses would have put his hand in his bosom to bring out a sign that the Israelites would understand. We understand now why Yeshua wanted to, to gather the little children. Let the little children come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. The, the chaik, or the bosom, is where uh, the, the bride or the children are gathered. And so there's those two identities of those who would be gathered into the bosom. And the Garden of Eden itself is, in a sense, forming a chik or a bosom for righteous souls. And so what John saw, where he says, He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now there's a, a principle here uh, based on the encampments of the twelve tribes of Israel. As those twelve tribes encamped, it said, so shall their journey be. In other words, they will travel in exactly the same manner as they camp. Nothing will change. And the four sides had four uh, flags, banners, they're called degalim in Hebrew, and each one had a symbol on it that reflected one of the four faces of the divine chariot that Ezekiel prophesied about. So it, it represents um, the four spirits, the four living spirits, it represents the four corners of the earth where there's particular things going on, and, and we'll look some more into that. But the idea here, getting back to the 12 kinds of fruit, is that in their encampments, the tribes were in place in order for them to achieve the maximum amount of fruit or fruitfulness. Whatever their gifts or abilities were, they were positioned in the division with another tribe or tribes who complemented either their strength or their weakness. So that when you put these three tribes in that division together, they achieved maximum fruitfulness. And their job, just as the priests and the Levites were to minister to the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel in their encampments were in turn to be a kingdom of priests to the nations. And in that sense, the whole nation was a kingdom of priests. Yes, there was a priesthood that ministered to Israel, but Israel itself and its tribes were to be a priesthood to the nations, to be that light to the nations, to express that fruit. And to share that fruit from the tree of life, i.e. the Torah, which was going to be the source of healing for the nations. Uh, I know that's the short form of that story, but I think it's enough of a foundation that you can understand the importance of why with this tree of life growing on both sides of the, the street of the holy city, that you can understand why there would be 12 different kinds of fruit and how the trees of the river would have healing. Because remember, the leaves are a metaphor for the pages of the Torah. And so the, the healing, again, it's coming through the word of Adonai, which I think is why Yeshua is called the word of God in the book of Revelation. 
And there was one particular time when, you know, how Yeshua had this habit of multiplying bread and fish. And one of those instances, he was able to multiply bread and he had 12 baskets left over. And if you think of what John saw with the 12 different kinds of fruit coming from the tree of life, because the 12 tribes are supposed to be priests and light to the nations, it makes sense why in that particular miracle, he would have wanted the 12 disciples to see those 12 baskets of fruit or bread left over. Because in, in Revelation 7, 17, it says this, For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's pretty cool. That To think that as you're gathered uh, into the chek, into the bosom of the garden, into the palace of Messiah, the lamb, he's going to be the one uh, who's not just in the midst of the throne. Remember, we keep talking about what is in the midst, Yeshua walking in the middle or the midst of the lampstand, the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, the, the water from the throne, the river from the throne, it's running through the midst of the city. So the lamb is going to lead them to these living fountains of water within the rivers of Eden. He's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. And he's going to feed them, it says. And so Yeshua doing this particular miracle where he's feeding everybody, not just the Torah. He's teaching them the Torah. He's teaching them about the salvation and the security of being gathered into the chek of the Garden of Eden again. He ensures that what is left over is 12 baskets of bread. Again, reminding them that as the 12 tribes of Israel, their job always was to be a light to the nations. Their job always was to extend the healing of the leaves of the Torah to the nations. Now, we, we did talk about Abraham. We'll back up a little bit here to Abraham's bosom. And we saw how it was associated with your intimate. Um, you know how Sarai said, I, I put my handmaid into your bosom, into your chek. In other words, you, you entered into a, an intimate relationship with her. So the, the relationship with children, of course, is more secure, comforting, and so forth. But for your bride, there's a, an intimacy. There's a meeting of the minds there. There's an agreement that occurs there because it, it will be a fruitful thing. The children kind of are fruit, but the bride attribute of being brought into the bosom of Abraham has to do with um, a, a true unity. Because in, in ancient times, a man's wife was sometimes called his tent. So we're looking at Abraham's bosom. It means his intimate. If we look at ancient times, a man's wife is called his tent. What do we know about Isaac? He took Rebecca into his mother's tent. And Jewish tradition gives us three miracles that were associated with Sarah's tent. You say, where is this in the Bible? It's not. But you might find some reflections of it in the work of Yeshua. In other words, Yeshua does specific things that if you were a Jewish person watching his ministry, it would ring a bell. Because in your tradition, you would have associated perhaps these actions or miracles with what you knew of Sarah's tent, that what had been handed down to you through tradition about the three miracles of Sarah's tent, if you saw Yeshua do these things in your culture, in your time period, and um, in your tradition of scriptures, it would have established him again as connected to the prophecy of Isaac. So here's the three things. And maybe you're already familiar with these, but maybe you never just thought of them in the context of what Yeshua did. 
First of all, it said that she had a Shabbat lamp that stayed lit from Arev Shabbat to Arev Shabbat. In other words, when, when she lit her Shabbat lamp, it stayed going for seven days. It never went out, in other words. It was almost like the, the, the Ner Tamid of the Mishkan, the, the menorah that um, was in place in the holy place, even though uh, it was said, I believe the western lamp of the menorah never went out, according to tradition. But the priest would have to light the other lamps from the western lamp. So it's, it's kind of a similar thing here, where inside Sarah's tent, there was a light that miraculously stayed lit. In the menorah, they believed that miraculously, no matter what, the western lamp never went out. Uh, and there's some Hanukkah connections there. There's other historical events that occurred that are associated with fire burning long beyond its natural ability to burn. And I'm not talking about the, the light in the temple for Hanukkah. I'm talking about other events that would have preceded that. And perhaps those events um, were connected with Hanukkah. There was, there was more than one Hanukkah, in other words, in history. The one we know of uh, was fairly recent in terms of history. There was pre those that preceded it. And it could be that those instances also were kind of piled up in, into the same story. At any rate, a perpetual lamp. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the dough, her, her challah, the dough that she prepared for Shabbat, her bread, it miraculously multiplied. That's pretty specific. She's making dough for Shabbat challah, and it miraculously multiplies. So now, if we look at the miracles of Yeshua, he seemed to, to go out of his way to make sure that when he multiplied bread, there was lots left over. And then the third miracle, they believed that the cloud of the divine presence rested on top of Sarah's tent. Uh, and the miracles that, that they say, you know, like I said, it's, it's not specified in scripture that these happen. It's within the tradition. But what they are is very consistent with the promise that's given to Sarah that she would be the mother of many nations and that kings of peoples would descend from her. So in this tradition, when Sarah died, the presence departed from the tent. It was kind of camped out over the top of her tent, they say. And when she died, the cloud moved off. Uh, you might have heard it called the Shekhinah. Uh, Shekhan means to dwell, like to just camp out and stay there. Uh, and they say this is what it was. It was like the Shekhinah. It just kind of camped out there until she died. And then it moved off. It disappeared. And this was, you know, for Isaac's grief, this would have probably accentuated it because the comfort of seeing the cloud over her tent, I'm sure, would have had not just a visual effect, but in his heart, because she had nurtured him, it would have made him miss her more. And then the text tells us when Rebecca is brought to Isaac, uh, before anything, we're told that, that he takes her and he puts her in Sarah's tent. And the tradition says once he did that, the presence, the cloud returned and once again camped over the top of the tent. And this was one way that Sarah's tent comforted Isaac. He saw that this is the right woman for me. This is the right bride. This is the one to embrace in my chik, in my bosom. Because this righteous woman will attract the Shekhinah. She will attract the divine presence back to my mom's tent. And that's a beautiful picture of who we should be as the bride of Messiah. Our very presence should be a uh, attracting the presence of Adonai, and it should bring comfort to people, but most of all, it should bring comfort to Messiah Yeshua.
because Isaac was the type. If uh, we go into Sarah's tent with that, that humble, eager to serve attitude that set Rebecca apart from her relatives, then it's like an invitation for the, the actual presence of Adonai to descend and to be an encouragement and to be a comfort to everybody who passes by. And because of this promise, um, Sarah's bread was multiplied to the nations. Remember that, that particular miracle that her dough would multiply? Well, Yeshua takes the dough, he takes the bread, and he multiplies it so that there's 12 baskets left over. There's a basket for each disciple. And what do we know about the disciples? Well, they are commanded to take that gospel out into all the nations. Go to all nations, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you. I've taught you the commandments and the application of the commandments. I want you to go out and teach the commandments and the application of the commandments. I want you to teach them how by your good behavior that they also can draw down the divine presence, that the, the Holy Spirit can rest on them as well. Revelation 22.5 says, there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. But remember, when John writes this, already this, this miracle of a light that doesn't go out is associated with Sarah's tent, the mother of many nations. So this particular prophecy we can associate with Sarah's tent. Uh, even though such a miracle would maybe be a, a tiny sign upon about the bosom of Abraham and the nature of who can reside in Abraham's bosom. But it's also a symbol of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And it shows how her being a mother of many nations, how her offspring, how these 12 tribes really are to be a kingdom of priests to the nations in order to share that dough, in order to share that presence of Adonai, in order to share that light that will never go out, that the, the lamp of the lamb will never go out. Revelation twenty two seventeen says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. So we have both Sarah and Rebecca who are a type of the bride. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, there's an equivalency of expression there. When you talk about the spirit, you're talking about the bride. Remember how the, the divine presence rested on Sarah's tent and then it returned when Rebecca went into the tent? So the spirit and the bride say, come. What would Rebecca have said to Isaac? Come, come inside the tent. I am your tent. Come inside the tent. I want to be in your bosom. I want to be in your embrace. I want to be concealed within your salvation. Sarah would have said the same thing to Abraham. Come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. When Sarah heard the prophecy of the angels, maybe she laughed, but she heard. And that little seed of thought took root. So at some point... She had to say to Abraham, come, come, hold me in your bosom. Let's be fruitful and multiply. Let's give this sign to our offspring who, who will pass back into the garden. It says, let the one who's thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. That goes back to Yeshua standing up and proclaiming to on the last great day of Sukkot to Jerusalem, he says, I am that river. Come and drink right here. 
what prophecies of Messiah we are getting way back in the bosom of Abraham, way back in the bosom of Isaac, the spirit and the bride saying, come. Revelation 5.13 says, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. So the, the one who sits on the throne the Lamb, who's also in the midst of the throne, they're calling down and they're saying, blessing and honor, glory and power to him who sits on the throne. Well, remember what we learned about Sarah's tent. It was said to have had a cloud of glory or the, the Shekinah over it. So that tradition tells us that there's an expectation that tent Sarah will represent this indwelling glory. That that's a prophecy of the indwelling glory that later John in chapter 5 tells us is resting upon Israel and Jerusalem who are Sarah's descendants. Because whether you're one of the tribes by lineage or whether you're one of the tribes by choice, by faith, you're all children of Abraham. The apostles taught us this. Whoever, however you come in, you are the descendants of Sarah, who was supposed to be the mother of many nations, just like your father Abraham, supposed to be the father of many nations. And these children, no matter where they come from, they are going to be included in the resurrection, and they are going to enjoy the indwelling presence of Adonai, because their character is, is just like that of their mother, Sarah, Tent Sarah. Their Shabbat lamps of the Holy Spirit are going to stay lit continually. It's consistent with who they are. Isaiah 66, 22 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Well, there we go again. This, this tradition of Sarah's lamp staying lit from Arev Shabbat to Arev Shabbat. When Isaiah says this, it would evoke that in the mind of an Israelite from one new moon to another, from one Shabbat to another. Her lamp stayed lit. There was always light in her tent. And he says, uh, this is going to be the way of the new heavens and the new earth, that the indwelling presence will abide there. And your Shabbat lamps, they're never going to go out. All flesh is going to come to worship before me. This is the, the heritage of the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. So Yeshua fulfilled all three signs of tent Sarah. Maybe it doesn't mean much uh, to the rest of the world, but to the Jewish world, this would be a powerful sign to, to take those three things of Sarah's tent, the, the abiding presence, the cloud over her tent, the, the lamp, that would stay lit from Shabbat to Shabbat, the dough that would miraculously multiply, Yeshua did these things. Matthew 14, 14. When Yeshua went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Yeshua said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And by the way, the grass in scripture 
um, it can represent again how human beings absorb the word of Adonai. Uh, goes back to the Song of Moses, um, where he says, "You know, let my words fall like dew on thirsty grass." So it's how you absorb the word. So it's not random that he says, "Have them sit down on the grass." He could have just said, "Have them sit down." No, he he adds have them sit down on the grass. They're about to absorb the word from me. They've been absorbing, and now they're going to absorb something else. It says, He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to who? The disciples gave to the multitudes. That was going to be their job. Their job was going to be able to take that bread of life, to take those 12 baskets and give it to the nations. It says, so they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. That's a, that's a pretty specific fulfillment. Something that had been associated with Sarah, the mother of many nations, we now have associated with her descendant, with Yeshua, who is also multiplying the, the dough. And he's multiplying the, the dough, the bread, to this multitude of people sitting on the green grass. Which again, if they're sitting on the green grass, then it suggests that at this moment, these people are thirsty and hungry for the word. They're able to absorb what he's saying. Sometimes Yeshua would talk to people and they just couldn't absorb it. It just bounced off of them, you know, like hot pavement. It just wasn't going to stick. But there, there is a remnant among the nations. There is a remnant out there that, that when the word of Adonai falls on them, they're going to be like green grass. And they're going to soak up that word like dew on thirsty grass. That's a great picture. That Yeshua not only is there to, to remind them of the miracle of Sarah's tent, but he's also there to remind them that Sarah was the mother of many nations. And as his disciples, his 12 disciples, each with his own basket of bread, by the way. That's, that's important. It's, in this particular case, it's not a different number. It's 12 baskets full of fragments. And that way, each disciple has a basket. And that way, as he sends those 12 disciples out, and remember back when we read, we said the, the leaves were for the healing of the nations. And there were 12 different kinds of fruit, one for every month. Right? Now, in the passage we read out of Isaiah 66, it says, It shall come to pass from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another. All flesh shall come to worship before me. So the disciples are representing through those 12 baskets, to take out to the nations that from one new moon to another, there's going to be 12 moons uh, that they're supposed to fill in there so that all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. And then, of course, uh, the fulfillment there of, of feeding those multitudes, multiplying that bread to a multiplied number of souls that it's going beyond these 12 tribes it was always intended to go beyond these 12 tribes that out there among the nations there was lots of green grass there was lots of people among the peoples that when they took the word of Adonai out to those people they would accept it they would receive it like the dew on thirsty grass. And you know what? Even if it was fragments, there were fragments in the basket, these people would be so hungry for the Word of God, they would just gobble up any fragments that they could possibly get a hold of. 
and it was going to draw down that divine presence into their lives as well, not just the 12 tribes.